When I first got into music production hardware, I saw the Digitact popping up everywhere, and I didn't quite understand why people liked it so much. And then, when I got really into music production hardware and started using a bunch of monophonic samplers, I was even more curious to see what made the Digitact so special. Now that I've got one, I totally get it. By the time I finally got my hands on a Digitact, I knew pretty well what I was getting myself into, but I still had to actually spend a good amount of time with it to form a complete opinion on it. And don't get me wrong, it's definitely got some limitations, but overall I do like it quite a bit. So let's start off with what makes this thing cool. First off, the build. The body is all metal and feels super solid, and it just looks super dramatic with its black finish, contrasty screens, and lighty uppy buttons. And they're clicky. Personally, I still definitely prefer pads for some proper finger drumming, but I did get used to the clicky buttons pretty fast. The knobs are endless encoders, which is fine, and here's an oddly specific thing that turns out to be really important. They talk really well to the screen. One of the reasons I love self-contained music production devices is that you can kind of get away from the traditional staring at a computer screen experience. And so I and a lot of my other fellow Groovebox nerds are probably a little bit more leery of screens than some others might be. And when I do have a screen, what I want is for that screen to feel like an extension of the physical controls, and that's exactly what the Digitact does. Genuinely, it makes some of the best use of a screen I've seen on a device. It's responsive and uncluttered, and gives you the extra control you need without getting in the way. But for those of you not familiar with the Digitact, let's go into what exactly this thing even is. At its core, the Digitact is a sampler. They sell it as a drum machine, but I think it goes beyond that to be more of a self-contained music production station, heavily based around samples, which you can either record in directly via its onboard inputs or load in via their software. Then you can play them on the buttons, and you can start to shape your sounds with pitch, bit crushing, distortion, Amp envelopes. Filter envelopes, which I especially like. Including resonance, and you've got multiple types to work with here as well. Plenty of control. Two LFOs, as of the latest firmware update. In this example, I've got this ARP bit with one LFO sent to the bit crushing amount and the other one sent to the pan, as you can probably hear. And then for this hi-hat, I've got one LFO sent to the pitch and the other sent, once again, to the panning. And send effects of reverb and delay. which are fully editable as well. These all really come in clutch, although I'd say my favorite is the filter envelope. That really goes a long way to shaping a sound into something unique and customized to the track that you're working on. You can automate these parameters either across a pattern, just recording stuff in live, or do it on a step-by-step -step basis. And that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the step sequencer on this thing. It's deep. And it's fairly simple to pick up the basics, but then you can go a lot further once you've got those down. You can record stuff in live either by just playing one shots, like I've already showed, or you can map those sounds to a keyboard, and you've got multiple octaves to work with, and you can record in quantized or unquantized, and it's easy to switch between them. If you want to program notes in or edit them, you'll be diving into the step sequencer. You've got your playhead moving across the different steps, and your multiple pages to work with. So each one of these is an individual step, so let me just load up a bunch and you'll see how that works. And if you hold down a note, you can start to edit its individual parameters. So let me add a second kick here and then hold this down and I can edit this on a step-by-step -step basis. So for instance, let's just uh, tune this one up 
specifically, and then make sure this one is tuned to be neutral. And now that specific step has that specific parameter assigned to it. And you can go really, really in depth with this, with all of these parameters and with conditional triggers. If conditional triggers sounds a bit intimidating to you, don't worry, I'm gonna show that and show you how it works and why they're useful and why they're really not that complicated in a little bit. But my point in showing you this is to show you how you're gonna be using this to get around the eight track uh, one sound per track limit. Because, let me just mute these real quick, you can switch between multiple sounds over the course of one track as long as the sounds aren't actually playing on top of each other. So check this out. We've got a couple of kicks here. If I hold this down, I can switch out the sample. Let's just do a random snare and a random uh, hat just so you get the idea. And you can still have notes going as these sounds change. If you've ever used the Innovation Circuit Rhythm or Polyand Tracker, this is gonna start looking very familiar. And this is how you're gonna get the true power of this thing unlocked. Because like multiple other hardware samplers, the Digitact has monophonic sample tracks. So on each of the eight tracks, you can only play one sound at a time, which initially seems super limiting. And in some ways it is. And I would very much love to see polyphonic sampling become the industry standard. But as it is, because you can switch between multiple sounds on one track, you can still have a lot going on and build up a very complete sounding track just with monophonic sample tracks. That's true for the Digitact and it's true for the Circuit Rhythm and the Polyand Tracker. You can get a lot more than a lot of people think out of these devices. It's also worth knowing that the samples recorded or loaded in are collapsed down to mono in the stereo spectrum as well. Another annoying limitation, but not one that you can't get around. With that being said, let's get back into the sequencer. I mentioned conditional triggers a little bit earlier, and there are also probability settings. These are gonna let you edit on a step-by-step -step basis how often a note will actually play. You can set how likely a step is to trigger, which is the probability. So if I hold this down, I can set it to be, say, 100%, so it'll trigger every single time the playhead goes over it, or maybe 50% or 25%. So it won't play very often and it'll be fairly random, but it will play just sometimes and you can get some nice variation out of that. Or you can set conditional triggers. What this means is that it will look at how many times it's played through your entire sequence and go, okay, if I am on say the first of two loop throughs, so the sequence is going to play in its entirety twice, right? For that first loop through, I will trigger the step. And for the second one, I won't. Or if I set it to two out of two, it will play on the second loop through and not on the first. And this can get a lot crazier than just two loop throughs. You can go pretty hard with this. And this is going to be how you're going to get around the four bar limitations. Because as you can see here, you're limited to four bars. So setting different sounds to only play during one loop through and not another using conditional triggers will let you kind of get around this four bar limitation. Take a listen to this beat as it loops twice. And I'll put some text up on the screen to show which steps are set to only trigger during the first loop through of two or the second loop through of two. Hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense once you actually see it. Now, I did feel the need to actually put up text to show you what the differences are, so they're fairly subtle and probably won't be consciously noticed by the average listener, but you absolutely can take this a lot farther if you've got some patience. That approach is not going to be for everyone, and it's definitely got limitations of its own. For instance, you can't stack different notes on top of each other to be triggered at different times. But regardless, it's at least a unique way of thinking about sequencing, and I've definitely seen some other manufacturers yoink features of that for themselves. And if you don't like that, you can change the speed of individual tracks. So you could say, have a long drawn out chord patch play half speed. So you could stretch that out to eight bars. You're just gonna lose resolution for your steps. So things will have to change a little bit more slowly. So for instance. <laughs> So 
So if I wanted to say this chord progression to last a full eight bars, not just four bars, I can go in and set this track specifically to be half speed. This is a terrible example because now it's out of sync and I'd have to re-record this part so you get the idea, but hopefully you're seeing where I'm going with this. The Digitect is also popular for sequencing external gear, and here's another feature it has that makes it stand out from other monophonic samplers. It has dedicated polyphonic MIDI tracks. Now, this synth sample, I just recorded directly into my Digitect from my Roland MC-101 because it's a nice patch and I just wanted something futuristic sounding. But that's not the only way to kind of harness the power of other devices with the Digitect, because it's also a very popular device for sequencing external gear. See these tracks that we haven't even dealt with? These are all dedicated MIDI tracks. So these don't produce any sound on their own and you can't load samples into them, which is kind of a bummer, but they are polyphonic and they can control other devices. All of these can. So you can expand this thing quite a bit. Now, it is worth noting that these polyphonic MIDI tracks do have some important limitations. And here's a comment from Jorb, who you should subscribe to, by the way, going a bit more in depth than I previously knew about. There are only four voices and they've got these limitations as well. But it is a really nice feature to have and piping the audio back in can get you some really good results. Overall, I've really been enjoying the Digitact. There's definitely some friction associated with making beats on it. For instance, uh, sometimes it takes a little extra time to choose samples, but of course, that's just a byproduct of having the ability to choose a bunch of samples from its internal memory. And uh, the step sequencer sometimes feels ever so slightly clunkier than some of the stuff I'm used to, like the circuit rhythm. But in most ways, to my eyes, since I started with the circuit rhythm, it feels like a circuit rhythm pro, which is pretty much exactly what I wanted, especially with stuff like filter envelopes, which I use all the time to really dial in and shape my sound. It takes samples and turns them into synths in a lot of ways. I really wish there was like a feature to add some glide or something, like a few more extra things, something like the MC-101 has, video coming on that soon enough. But overall, it's a very powerful device. And I think as long as you're down for a more traditional groove box experience and don't mind monophonic sampling, it's still absolutely worth it in 2021. But it's not for everyone. So if you'd like to check out some other groove box reviews, sampler focused, you can click or tap up over here. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll be back with a new video in a little bit.